Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. In this episode, we speak with international hockey consultant, Mark Simon. Mark spent 15 years in the Chinese hockey industry, doing everything from coaching to program creation to on the ground operations. He has also collaborated with numerous media outlets on navigating the Chinese landscape from a marketing perspective. Mark is a key member of the leadership team for China Hockey Group, the country's largest organization dedicated to running high level adult and youth hockey programs, both locally and on the world stage. He is also the founder of Hockey Hands, a non-profit organization teaching English and hockey to orphans, migrant children, and children with disabilities. Obviously, this is a hockey-centric discussion, but the business and cultural nuances are plentiful as we explore the game's growth and future, the players, including kids, women, and adult participation, the geography of hockey in China, including where are the rinks and arenas located. We look at the ancillary participants, such as referees and fans. And lastly, we look at what a professional league in China might look like and what would it take for becoming a professional hockey player in China to be an economically viable career path. Enjoy. Generally, a family needs to be pretty affluent in order to afford what hockey costs. And I guess that's the case anywhere to a point, but it's certainly exaggerated in China. So that cuts out, obviously, a, a good chunk of the population. Hockey's perceived as a tough guy sport. And so a lot of them will put their kids into hockey if they think their kid's not a tough kid. Some of the Chinese coaches I used to work with, they'd always say that. You were like the, the hospital for these kids who weren't tough enough. Parents would send them here, go get tougher, go play hockey. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally-minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies enter the Asia-Pacific market market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Mark, thanks for coming on the show today. Good to have you. Hi, Todd. Thanks a lot for having me. So as we usually do with our guests, we would love to get a little bit of an introduction into how you ended up in China and working in China. Sure. Um, yeah, I uh, grew up playing hockey my whole life in Montreal, uh, mostly a little bit in Toronto. Um, then I worked for CIBC for a couple of years here after uh, I realized I wasn't going to play pro hockey. Um, that was after going to play in the CJEP League, uh, which is like the Quebec College League. Um, and yeah, and then uh, after CIBC, um, uh, I realized I wasn't cut out for the corporate world exactly. And so my uh, ex-girlfriend and I at the time decided to go teach English in uh, Beijing for uh, for a year. Um, and then a year into that, I kind of did... I've found hockey. I didn't realize there was any hockey there at all when I, when I left and um, yeah. And then I ended up staying and working in hockey for uh, 13 more years. So um, that's basically the story. At a high level, maybe you can just broadly talk about what does the hockey culture look like in China and maybe point to how it's different than it would be in North America and Canada or the U S. Sure. Um, I mean, not to sound too dramatic, but yeah, I mean, there isn't much of a hockey culture uh, in China, unfortunately. Obviously, it's it's stuff that people like me are, are trying to work on and grow. But um, yeah, I mean, the common person, you know, it doesn't it doesn't enter into their uh, their their zone um, at all, really. Um, you know, it's really only the, the hockey parents, the hockey families um, who who end up learning anything about the sport. Um, you know, pro hockey hasn't been there, uh, obviously, because China hasn't been a hockey country, so there's no reason to put pro hockey there. But um, for, for very long, the Kunlun Red Star has been there a little bit. That's, I guess, raised the profile somewhat. 
um, but not so much in terms of, you know, real participation numbers, I would say. Um, so yeah, it's tough, you know, in, in, in North America, everyone, you know, goes around and you see hockey billboards, you see hockey players on commercials all the time. Um, you know, that, that doesn't happen there because obviously anyone who plays hockey in China, even on the national team, um, isn't really very recognizable to anyone else, uh, in, in like the, you know, a society at large. Younger kids. How are we finding them? How are we getting hockey in front of them? How are we introducing hockey to them? And, of course, their parents, because they're probably the the actual customer that we're trying, you know, it's where the cereals on the on the, you know, on the on the lower shelves to get in front of the kids. And then, you know, the kids have to get their parents permission and that whole thing. So starting with the younger kids, what does the training look like? What is it, uh, you know, how is it different? How would you approach it that you know of different training kids in China versus how you would train them in, in the U.S. and Canada, what you would start with? Uh, just just give us an idea of what it looks like at those early ages. You know, traditionally, it was only small uh, shopping mall rinks that existed in China. So up until about, I'd say, six, seven years ago, uh, most of the rinks in the country were were somehow in a mall or in some sort of commercial area, uh, not really standalone rinks. So if you look at that, um, you know, and the reason they did that, of, of course, a part of the reason was that, you know, the common shopper would see the rink and say, hey, cool, I want to put my kid into some sort of skating thing here. Um, and that's how they would attract people. Um, they'd have a few figure skating coaches, a few hockey coaches, and off you go. Um, those coaches then would usually uh, just do private lessons with kids. So, okay, let's go, you know, little Bobby, you know, get your skates, whatever. And you're going out with coach Wong for an hour, um, once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Um, so, and that's, you know, very uh, in an in individual basis, typically, because, you know, again, without the, um, with the absence of, of, a great deal of hockey experience, like in a world top 10 country, um, you know, the coaches aren't really aware of like, what's a learn to skate program, you know, like, what is it, you know, how do you organize something where you got 30, 40, 50 kids on the ice separated into good little groups, according to level, uh, make it fun, play music, have little toys on like uh, that whole thing, which, you know, the like can skate program in Canada, for example, the U S has, has, a uh, has its own learn to skate. I'm sure Sweden, Finland, everyone else has one one too, um, you know, that really targets sort of, you know, uh, early childhood education methods and, and, and really aims to kind of, um, make it fun. Um, so unfortunately that part is still a work in progress in China. Um, you know, kids don't really get that like overwhelming sense of like, Hey, this is super fun. And that's, you know, you should fall in love with this cause it's so much fun and, uh, and develop that way. It's more sort of like an old fashioned style where it's like, okay, this is like a course, you know, it's a lesson. Um, actually in Chinese, like they always call them like xiao ke, right? Like small, small class, you know, and I'm always, whatever I end up working, I always try to say like, Hey, you know, it's not really a class. Like it's supposed to be fun. It's like hockey practice. Um, so I'd say that's, I don't know if that answers all of your question, but, uh, hopefully it answers most of it. It does. And then moving on to teenagers who, you know, have a mind of their own. They have their own opinions. They have their own likes and dislikes. And I think, you know, the the subject matter changes when, you know, just in how you coach, how you train, how you motivate, how important is how they feel versus how their parents feel. Talk to us a little bit about what it's like working with teenagers and trying to introduce them to hockey. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess, um, there's not too many who are being in, well, yes and no, but there's not too many who are typically being introduced to it at that age because typically they'd already be, you know, playing if they're playing at 13 or 14, it's because they were playing at, you know, seven or eight, usually not always. Um, uh, now there's actually a lot of, you know, in my opinion, it's not the best way of going about it, but there's been a lot of high school programs targeting, you know, high school and getting, you know, 12, 13 year olds into it, which, you know, you don't have to be, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a genius in, in uh, any of this to realize that that's, it's a little late. Um, if we're looking at a big group to kind of filter through a new system and, and develop within it, you know, you'd rather start at, you know, age five, six, seven, eight, rather than 13, 14. Um, but all that being said, 
Um, you know, most, most kids who are good at by age 10 or 11, their parents know that they need to leave China. Um, so you're not left with very much, um, you know, because, and also, uh, as you alluded to, I think, uh, briefly there, uh, earlier with the education piece, you know, high school becomes super competitive. Um, so usually kids get chopped a lot of activities out of their lives that they might've been doing when they were, you know, in, in primary school. So yeah, it's, um, like I said, you know, the, the best ones, uh, the parents know they got to get out of there. So usually, you know, the, the whole family will move or half the family will move, uh, to Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Boston, Chicago, somewhere where there's hockey, um, and, and to play in like a real, you know, have a chance to, to get to the highest level, um, you know, down the road. So, yeah, so there's not much left. Um, the ones who are left, you know, uh, unfortunately now there's been, you know, a lot of introductions of new teams like there's this in Beijing for example they have their club team they have a school team they have a district team and then some of them have like team Beijing Um, so you know when you start to get all that it's like okay that's great that you know you're trying to get more games for kids but it also kind of dilutes whatever coaching is happening uh, in one place versus another Um, the messages that they're being sent there's not much coordination between all of them so yeah it just kind of becomes very confusing confusing. Um, and then you mix that with just this ongoing private lesson, um, prioritization by these ring companies. Uh, It just, yeah, again, I'm always about making it fun. Um, and, uh, unfortunately that's, that's not always uh, put at the top of the priority list. So what about adults? Let's, let's address the, the breadth of adults that are playing this. So I know there's a lot of adult leagues, I know you're going to mention the fact that it's it's probably uh, maybe a bit of an assumption. It's probably being driven by a lot of the expats. Talk to us about what the leagues look like. How many? Where are they? What is the makeup of these leagues as far as the nationalities of people who play? And is there any interest from adults, local Chinese adults who might gain an interest in the sport later in life and then where do they go what do they do is there training programs is there learn to skate for adults happening in china most of the expat leagues there's not that many of them but like let's say shanghai beijing hong kong all have um like well organized um you know going for i'd say most of them 15 20 years now um uh of yeah like 100 to 200 players uh, I'd say on average, yeah, 70 to 80 percent are expats. At this point, it was it was a bigger number, you know, back when I started playing in 07. Uh, it was probably like 90, 95 percent, at least in Beijing. Um, so, you know, over the years, there have been a few more uh, local Chinese uh, men and women, mostly men, uh, trying to get into this, uh, sometimes because their kids play. So they're like, hey, you know, that looks like fun. Why don't I try? Um, there's not a lot of learn to play, learn to skate programs for adults. I ran one for a couple of years when I was in Shanghai, um, which was a lot of fun. Did the same kind of for a, a girls program that really didn't e- exist on its own then at that time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it's tough to kind of, um, market that because it's just so new to the society. Right. So there will be a lot of adults who play, you know, soccer for fun with their friends because everyone knows soccer. It's a worldwide sport. Um, same, similar to basketball. Um, but you know, the idea of like these beer leagues that we have in North America, that are just rampant. Um, you know, I'd say though, it's not even that big with those other sports, uh, as, as you might think it would be with the population, but especially with hockey, it's, it's pretty small. So if you go to the other cities that even, you know, after those three, you know, you'll have a collection of adults that play. Um, and, and often there will be more Chinese in those, you know, um, uh, uh, in terms of overall percentage, but um, it's not leagues, really. It's just, you know, a bunch of people getting together for pickup hockey. You mentioned earlier, most ice services used to be located in malls. And I, I have to agree, you know, as, as I was making visa runs in the late 2000s uh, to Hong Kong, uh, that's where I was seeing ice surfaces. Even in Shenzhen, it was you go to the mall and on one of the floors, they'd raise the roof or whatever. And yeah, that was that was your ice surface. Right. So I want to know how many recreational ranks 
are currently active in China? If you if you had to estimate, are are they full of participants the way are they the way that they are in Canada's? How much activity on them is 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 hockey versus public skating versus figure skating versus you know jam can curling? I mean, what what are they being used for? I'd say there's about uh, 500 in the country. I, that'd be my best estimate um, with probably about, you know, 80 ish in Beijing, um, you know, probably, you know, 40, 30, 30 ish in Shanghai. Um, and then kind of the rest sort of spread out in yeah, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Chengdu, uh, Qingdao, um, uh, Harbin, obviously up north, and Chichihar have have a handful each as well. Um, so yeah, th- there are more standalone rinks now. A lot of them are the bubble rinks, uh, like sort of the air dome things. Um, and yeah, they're not as full as they should be. Um, again, if you have rink owners who you know, you know, God bless their souls, uh, have 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 tried to you know, build up some rinks and do all that. And that that's fantastic. Um, but you know, it's one thing to build the, the, the building. It's another thing to, uh, know how to run it properly and have programs that will fill the ice and, and marketing towards people in the community that will effectively get them into, um, into skates. Um, and that's for hockey and figure skating, curling you really there's not much going on with that um but in terms of hockey and figure skating they've tried with short track too because china is actually quite good had some success in short track uh over the years um but it's just again it's you know short track's not that much fun for kids really it's like i, I mean i i'm not taking anything away from the athletic prowess needed to to be successful in that sport but um you know it's like here just you know skate around in a circle really fast like it's just not the same so hockey has a real opportunity to be that super fun cool winter sport where you get to be part of a team so figure skating also has that edge on hockey since china is more used to uh, individual sports overall uh they, they don't have much success on the national level with team sports and it, it's not a huge thing for kids yet to really be signed up for uh for 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 a team sport period never mind on the ice so um yeah you know uh without the knowledge and the background uh, of, of someone say who grew up in canada or the u.s or somewhere where there's hockey and you know, okay, what does a hockey program look like from age four to age 18? Um, you know, you're sort of just winging it and you're sort of trusting a lot of the coaches who come down from the Northeast um, as, as you know, coaches who usually don't get too much coaches training before after they leave the national team or leave their city team. Um, and it's like, okay, well, what do we do? Right. And they're, and they're supposed to be the hockey experts. Um, you know, can they teach a, a decent private lesson or teach a few, you know, skills to kids for sure. Um, but, you know, growing the game and, and, and running programs and all that stuff is, is a whole different, um, you know, sack of potatoes. You mentioned a bunch of the cities where most of the rinks were. I wanted to get maybe a geographical representation of, of hockey in China, just you know, based on the light assumption that maybe it's it's more popular in the north of China than in the south. And maybe you can point to why that might be. I don't think it's always just due to weather, to be honest. However, I do know that I spent some time in Harbin and during a New Year's one, one time in, in 2009, 2008. And there was a lot of kids walking around with New Year's New York Islanders gear on, like just a lot of them. And I didn't understand why, what was going on. And then I heard there was a camp and then one of the owners of the Islanders happened to be from China. And so, they, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on up there for, for that reason. I think it might've been like their hometown or something, but um, just anyway, if you could maybe geographically lay out what hockey looks like around China and maybe talk about why. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it had did to- the only history of hockey really does exist in, in Heilongjiang province, which is, uh, Harbin, Chichihar. Um, those are the two main cities. Uh, there's also, you know, Liaoning province, Shenyang is, is also up there. Dalian where you were, uh, as well. Um, but really only in Harbin, or been in Chichihar, is there a big time sort of, well, big time, I say that with a grain of salt, but a big, uh, like a, more of a, a, you know, that goes beyond say 20, 30 years uh, where, you know, people play hockey, it freezes in the winter, you can go play outside. Um, 
But again, it's not something that was ever really pushed into mainstream society. You know, it was it was mostly, um, you know, sports schools um, where kids, you know, just learn hockey and, and usually don't learn much, much else after, you know, a pretty early age, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, all that being said is that, you know, then it sort of filtered down to Beijing, which is still, you know, in the northern part of the country. Um, and then it just kind of picked up from there, I'd say, into other big cities. So uh, Shanghai kind of started after Beijing. Then you had, you know, I mean, it sort of skipped over, I guess, Qingdao in a way, which is on the way. Um, and then it just, yeah, went to the other first tier cities. So like the Shenzhen's, the Chengdu's, uh, the Chongqing's, where, you know, you started having some r- more rinks built, uh, a few more kids playing. Um, but yeah, uh, as you alluded to, it's not um, it's not just based on geography, uh, even though some places are 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 cold, like, you know, hockey weather, quote unquote. Um, it's really about, you know, the economic situation of, of a city more so. Um, and then just to touch on the New York Islanders thing, I mean, yeah, there was a thing called Project Hope, which Charles Wong initiated um, some years ago. I don't remember exactly which I think it was like, oh, four or five or something like that, but I can't remember exactly where a bunch of money got, you know, put into stuff to help hockey grow in China. Um, and it's funny, you said you saw a bunch of New York Islanders jerseys. Really, that's the only evidence I've seen of that program other than hearing about it, um, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, it's a bit of a, a sad story for me because, you know, if that, if, if the person who was handed that money, um, you know, did have experience in, in a hockey country, probably a lot more could have been done with it. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's sad that that happened, um, you know, in a, in a similar, but different way. I mean, that's kind of why, you know, Misha song was drafted in 2015 to the NHL to the New York Islanders by uh, Charles Wong. So, and, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, Misha's not, not, not hasn't really progressed in, in the way that maybe they thought um, it was certainly an off the board pick. Uh, no doubt. Yeah. So that's, I guess, my answer there. Let me know if I missed anything. That's great. No, I appreciate that. But it, and it also inspires me to want to ask. We know from a lot of different podcasts covering a lot of different topics that when you're doing business in China, it's done differently. OK, we'll just leave it at that. Now, I wanted to ask you as somebody who's you know, growing a sport, a North American sport, uh, in no, no offense to, to all the Europeans that play it, but, uh, I'm Canadian. So I feel like I have to say that or they'll take my citizenship away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 it's okay. a fellow Canadian. You know what I mean? Exactly. Uh, exactly. We, we try to own hockey every, every time we can, but yep. you know, when you're growing something like that, I'm wondering, and I'm, I'm trying to tiptoe into this kind of question, but do you face unique challenges, instances, ways of doing business development, ways of relationship building, ways of, of, of just doing things that, you know, as you started to get to understand China that surprised you, some, some things that you had to learn that, you know, we don't just, can, we can't just do things the way that we grew up doing that come naturally. There was, there was some new skills you had to learn in trying to, you know, be a, a sport developer in China. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, it's hard to remember. You know, the first first time that that hit me, um, but de- it definitely hit me hard, um, and it definitely you know popped up a lot. Um, and you know, by the end, by you know my last couple of years there, I, I you know was much better at dealing with it, you know, and much better at um, at, at at navigating through the those kinds of waters that were very shocking at first. Um, you know, I really, I know it's like this everywhere, and but you know, in China, it's very much about relationships. Guanxi, um, I'm sure that's that, that term has come up on, on other podcasts. Um, you know, it's, it's all about that. And, you know, if you, you know, there's always got to be, you know, in the face, you know, like how, how do you, you know, how do you address someone, you know, and then some, you know, if I, I, I had to learn like, okay, you can't just be, as honest as you'd like to be, because, you know, typically Chinese people don't want to have a confrontation, you know? Um, so you can't just say, Hey man, come on. Like, what what were you doing? Like, it's like, Whoa, why are you coming at me? Like, no, I'm not coming at you. I just, you know, like, so you really have to learn how to do that, um, in the right way. Um, and, and then, yeah, the relationship thing, you know, it's, it's, 
how do you, uh, you know, sometimes you have to say, Hey, I, I gotta, like for me, uh, you know, I'll just give an example of a guy who's a, become a very good friend of mine. Um, who's Mr. Fu, who's the, uh, chairman of champion rinks, which is the biggest uh, rink company in China. Uh, all of them in mall rinks. They've got about 30, 35 rinks around the country, some big, some small. Um, and in Beijing, for example, they have had the best youth teams for, for years, like since I'd say the mid 2000 mid, yeah, mid teens 2010s whatever you call that decade um and you know but he's a great guy and you know he gave me a chance in 2015 to run uh, an international tournament um in china uh, i did that in 2010 and 2011 uh with the imperial guard my first club but then i was living in shanghai at the time and i just uh, i knew him a little bit i approached him i said hey i want to run this tournament with you know a couple teams from beijing shanghai hong kong uh, I think I can't remember who, who all came now, Singapore, maybe. Um, and, you know, he's like, yep, yeah, sure. Here gave me the cheapest deal on ice. You know, I said, OK, I need 55 hours of ice over four days, whatever it was. Um, and so he and I have been great friends. And then in 2017, when the Canadian governor general, uh, David Johnson, came to visit, you know, the embassy asked me to put on some kind of an event. For, for him because he's a hockey guy. So I went to Mr. Fu. I said, hey, I want to do a, a game with the Canadian Governor General. You know, let's get some kids who play here um, and we'll play a little exhibition game. I'll invite a few other Canadians who are in town uh, coaching or working in hockey and we'll, we'll have a little exhibition game with them. And that was great. And of course, he loved that. He got a cool picture with the Canadian Governor General. So, I mean, that guy for me is a guy who kind of got it. I helped him with something. He's helped me with stuff. So all that to say, it is much different. We know, and I mentioned that earlier, hockey is like a rite of passage here in Canada. Everybody plays it. Everybody knows about it. But I'm curious about in China, and I want to talk about the parents and dive in just a little bit on that. What kinds of parents are signing their kids up for hockey or even skating? But even more importantly, what are they coming to you with as their reasoning? What is their inspiration? What are they looking for? Are they looking for, hey, I really feel like it's important for my kid to learn how to team sports? Okay. I'm, I'm going to assume that's maybe not it. Or, you know, hey, listen, I just want my, my kid to be more physically active. Or I just love hockey and I want him to play hockey. Like, what? Kind of, what are the what kinds of parents are coming and what are they telling you? What are you gleaning out of them putting their kids in hockey that you've seen as their inspiration or motivation or the outcomes they're looking for by having their children learn hockey? Well, if they don't have money, they're probably not coming. So obviously there's levels to that. But generally, you know, a, a family needs to be pretty affluent in order to afford what hockey costs. Um, I guess that's the case anywhere to a point, but it's, it's certainly uh, exaggerated in China, um, partly due to the reasons I mentioned before, which is that, you know, if you're not getting, you know, 50 kids on the ice all the time, then, you know, you need to charge every person a lot more than you would if you were, you know, kind of using things in a, in a, more experienced kind of way. Um, so yeah, that cuts out obviously a, a good chunk of the population. Um, the other one would be, you know, hockey's perceived as a, as a, a tough guy sport. Um, and so a lot of them will put their kids into hockey if they think their kid's not a tough kid. Uh, so, you know, some of the Chinese coaches I used to work with, um, you know, they, they always say that, you know, that like we were like the, the, the hospital, like for these kids who weren't tough enough, you know, the parents would send them here, go, you know, get tougher, go play hockey. So I'd say though, that's the, the, the two biggest, um, no, there's not my, I mean, the odd one has heard about hockey and team sports in North America because their brother or sister has already moved to, to, to some city in North America. So they're like, Oh yeah, you know, all the kids here play sports. So some of them do have that in their heads and, and say, yeah, you know what? I want my kid to play team sport or become more socially aware and, and competent and things like that. But it's definitely the minority. Um, it's definitely those first two I mentioned that, that I'd say are, are uh, the big majority of parents who, who will bring their kid to a rink. Okay, quick question about one of the other aspects. What about referees? Uh, who are they? Where do they come from? Are they local? How good are they? Do they understand the game? Do they call the game differently? Yeah, so, you know, in, in North America, most referees, and I'm assuming it's the same in, 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 you know, other European hockey countries, most of the referees are existing or former hockey players. Um, in China, 
there are not many former hockey players. Um, there are not many existing hockey players. So um, there's not a lot of, first of all, there's not a lot of referees. It was all, it was constantly an issue. I mean, like when I used to organize tournaments, um, you know, I knew about guys, I knew who the good refs were everywhere. Like I just knew who the good Chinese refs were. Unfortunately, there weren't that many. Um, there's a, probably a few more now than there was, you know, three, four, five, six, seven years ago. Um, but yeah, there's only a handful. I'm like, okay, it's, you know, like you, you, and you, and I'll, I could call them say, I've got a tournament in Seoul or I got a tournament in Beijing or Chengdu or wherever it is. And I need some refs. Um, or I'd, I'd go to Hong Kong and Hong Kong usually had, um, a good stable of, of like expat guys who, who, who were good level referees. Um, and yeah, since I've refed since I was 14 years old, um, you know, I'm pretty anal about how refing works. And, uh, so yeah, I ran a few clinics over the years for just kind of, you know, teenage kids that I coached or, um, some older guys who were playing in the, in the adult league, um, just doing basics of refing. Um, and yeah, so a lot of the people who end up getting into refing and like refing like the BHA, like the, the, the youth league in Beijing, for example, are people who don't have much experience in the sport and that can be very tough. You know, it's, you know, you, you're probably not going to be a great official if you've never actually played the game. So yeah, never mind on ice, you know, and a lot of them unfortunately are brought in that, you know, don't have much skating experience. So you can imagine how that all goes. So yeah, it's not a great scenario. Um, but again, I don't really isolate it as like, this is a refereeing problem. Um, you know, that's just part of it when you grow a sport and you have a proper development program, um, you know, the officiating of the sport is, is part of that uh, bigger piece. We interviewed uh, Benjamin Wall, from, and he represents Borussia Dortmund, the, the football club, uh, and, and how he was pointing out that the way soccer fans behave in China is very different in the West, which inspires me to want to ask about fanship in China. Now, what are they like? Who are they? Is it just parents? Are there other hockey enthusiasts? Uh, do they understand the game? Do they boo, cheer, hiss? You know, getting fights in the stands. Uh, you know, what 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 is that? What does that experience look like for fans? Um, you know, how do the arenas put on the experience for the fans? And you know, what do they focus on? Do they have favorite teams? Are they bleeding certain colors and wearing the jerseys, or do they just have favorite players and that's what draws them to come and watch the game? Tell us about what fanship looks like for hockey in China. It's not a big thing. That's the first thing I'd say. I mean, when the Kunlun Red Star started playing uh, home games, uh, I mean, part of the reason they've split their home seasons in Beijing and Shanghai is because Shanghai, just for whatever reason, has has uh, a several uh, rinks that are, you know, in the four to six thousand seat range and Beijing doesn't. So Beijing just has like the, the Cadillac center. I don't even know what it's called now. Um, that's, you know, seats 14, 15,000. Um, and then it just, after that goes down to like the national stadium, which I think is still 10 or 11, then down to like a thousand. And so the KHL said that's too small. So, um, that's why they played a bunch of seasons in Shanghai. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, there, there was, there was never a lot of fans. Um, you know, there was never, and, but again, it, it's all, this also is part of the, the bigger issue. You know, you can't just be like, Hey everyone, there's this hockey game in town. Like what's hockey, you know? So, um, were there people who went? Yeah, there'd be a couple hundred people who went to to the games, you know, in, in either city. I mean, I think sometimes like, they, they, you know, and then they, you know, the team would give away tickets, you know, and I actually was was doing a lot of consulting with them at the time. Like, can't give them away because then people always expect them to be free. And like, we don't want this to be free. Like, so you don't have to charge an arm and a leg. But, you know, I think at the time I said, do three for 100 RMB, you know, like that's the, you know, it's like going to a movie, you know, so it's a it's a fair price, but it's not um, it's not free. So, yeah, um, a lot of the people who ended up going were just people like, oh, somebody gave me this ticket for free. I don't know. Like I was uh, I'm not doing anything tonight. I'll just go. And so, um, you know, there's been a few other like news pieces over the years um, where, you know, you, you'd have people in there. I think Sasha Petrosich of the CBC, uh, when he did a story a little while back, he, you know, went into the, the, the Beijing game of the Red Star and, you know, interviewed like an old lady. And he's like, do you know what this is? And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know. I, she's like, there's a Chinese team, but I don't see Chinese players on the team. So, yeah, um, were there a few, you know, I'd say a couple dozen uh, fans that we would say, like, who come and cheer and, uh, yeah, but... Um, it's not really a thing. Like, it's just not, 
it's not there yet. We're, we're a decade, a decade early on, on, on that question, really kind of being able to be answered uh, in the way that I guess you'd hope. Okay, well, let's let's jump to the creme de la creme and talk about pro leagues. How many pro teams are there? What does professional hockey look like in China? Is it all imported? Is it only being, you know, can you only watch it on TV? Do they have, you know, pro teams? Do they have players who go pro? You talked about draft potentials. Talk to us about a professional path, professional team, professional hockey in China. Well, at the current moment, Due to COVID, it, it, there there is none uh, right now because the only team uh, which was uh, which started in 2016 is the Kunlun Red Star, um, and they came in with for the first year it was just the the KHL team. Um, it was mostly Russian led, um, and then for 17, 18, 18, 19, and 1920, um, yeah, uh, they added. Uh, a women's team, an MHL team, which is the U20 league in Russia, and a VHL team, uh, which is the second division of the KHL. So, you know, those teams, um, like I said, with the K team was, was swapped between Beijing and Shanghai. Um, you know, over the years, uh, heritage players became a thing. So as of the second season, um, with a new management team in place that was more North American, um, they were able to get a lot of these heritage guys like Brendan Yip, Victor Bartley, um, Zach UN. Zach UN was there the first year, but uh, as well, but uh, Luke Lockhart, uh, Cor- Corey Kane, um, who else am I missing here? Tyler Wong, Spencer Fu, Parker Fu, a bunch of guys who, who have some a- uh, Chinese ancestry. Um, but in terms of actual Chinese guys who grew up playing in China, no one can really play at that level. Um, you know, they, they, they're just not, not at that level, even guys on the national team or, or team Harbin or team Chichi Har. Um, they just aren't, you know, they, they did force them into a lot of these VHL games and some of the younger ones went to the MHL team, but, um, you know, it wasn't really an effective uh, experiment. Like if you look at, and so now they're back now that they still have the women's team, which plays in the Russian women's league. Uh, it's called the, the Shenzhen Vanka Rays, but they're under the, the KRS uh, banner, uh, Kunlun Red Star banner. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the men's team is also based um, outside of Moscow uh, because of COVID and, and all the travel and stuff. So um, yeah, so there isn't really much of a dream for kids like to say, like, I'm going to grow up and play pro anywhere. Like, again, it's, we're just too, early for that so you know this team was put there i think to obviously help the national team develop for 2022 um but you know that didn't really happen um very very well um it you know despite the heritage players being there now it's been a little choppy and messy uh with with how it's all gone um in terms of how they dealt with the ciha and vice versa and just that relationship wasn't always smooth sailing so um it has certainly hampered um the level of, of where that team is today. This has been an amazing conversation, and I would love to ask you for a couple of names you can drop of people you think would also have amazing conversations on this podcast that you would like to listen to. Sure. I uh, thought about this. And so the first one I would give you is a guy named Matthew Waitley, uh, who goes by Matt, Matt Waitley. He's from Ottawa. Uh, he's the director of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in uh, Shanghai and um, also a hockey guy. But um, yeah, he's married a, a Shanghainese girl. Great guy. Uh, one of my good buddies. And the second person would be Alex Sher, um, who is done a tons of work um, in the in the business business area, uh, research, uh, translation, uh, intercultural communications with, uh, between American stuff and Chinese stuff. Um, really smart guy, also a hockey guy. So I'd say those two guys would, uh, would definitely be a good uh, conversation for you. Awesome, man. Mark Simon, you're an international hockey consultant, a nonprofit founder, and you got a passion for sports in the world stage. I appreciate you coming on the show today, my friend. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate it. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jian.